This is from A Short History of the 20th Century by John Lukacs, published in 2013. And I'm using a um, thin, cheap condenser microphone with a plus five decibel uh, preamplifying manual ad on the uh, piece equalizer APO configuration. And I'm using a custom uh, slight bass boost and a slight high end boost with the mid range uh, lowered a little bit. So, like a double hump. And uh, let's see, the, the physical microphone setting is at a 70%. Okay, this is chapter nine the wave of the future. The Hitler decade, his domination of Europe, the coming of the Second World War. Even before the Second World War began, Hitler came to rule much of Europe. He had thought that he could achieve even more, that he could dominate most of Europe without a war. The war then showed that his abilities as determined and often brutal statesmen were matched, well often, by his capacities as a military leader. Blind he was not. All of his pronouncements and extreme decisions notwithstanding, he did not want a big war. This we know from his disappointment when the news came on September 3, 1939, that after all, Britain and France, France had chosen to declare war against Germany. He knew that the British and French had done this reluctantly. He knew that all through the 1930s, his potential opponents, including even the great powers, had not confronted him for all kinds of reasons, primarily because they wanted to avoid a Second World War. We must consider, too, another of his limits. Many of his opponents thought and said that he wanted to rule the world. No, he wanted to rule most of Europe and realize all the advantages that would accrue to his Germany as a matter of course. To rule Europe was enough, perhaps even more than enough. But there was yet another constraint that made him push forward, if need be, at the cost of a great war. He believed that time was against him. This was not so. In 1939, even his often impetuous friend Mussolini wrote to him that this was not so, that he need not hurry. This was perhaps Adolf Hitler's greatest mistake. The result was a Second World War, but at what cost? The 1930s were his decade, but 1934 was not his best year. How he consolidated his power and prestige and reputation within a 12-month in Germany was and remains amazing but he convinced himself that he had to get rid of most of his potential opponents. On June 30th, 1934, his secret police minions murdered hundreds of men, some of them from within his own party. The others not, including General Kurt von Schleicher, Hitler's predecessor as chancellor, killed together with his wife. It did not matter. What mattered, lamentably so, is that the most conservative and respectable elements in Germany, the army and the churches, including even a few leaders of the Catholic Church, after June 30th, went on to respect and admire Hitler. He had a small setback in 1934 in his foreign policy. This involved Austria, where the National Socialist Party and its adher ad adherents were growing even stronger. In July of that year, some of them rose in rebellion against the Catholic conservative regime of the Austrian Chancellor Engelbert Dolfus. Dolfus was not a leftist, not a liberal, not a Democrat. In February 1934, he had crushed the Austrian Socialist Democrats, a not inconsiderable party, with cannons and guns. A Nazi he was not. On July 25th, some of the Austrian Nazis rose up, broke into the Chancellery, and killed Dolfus. Yet the Austrian police and army came up and the Nazi conspirators were defeated. Even now it is unclear whether they, they had been not merely inspired but supported or urged on by Hitler. It seems they were not. In any event, it was a setback for him. Even Mussolini made noises and moved some of the Italian army close to the Austrian border. Hitler's setback was temporary. He was beginning to dismantle the Versailles Treaty. Hitler was to be rearmed with shiny new means and results. In 1935, the British government chose to sign a naval rearmament treaty with Germany, not at all unfavorable to the latter, but then Hitler's navy was the least important of his armed forces. In Nuremberg, he di dictated new laws excluding Jews on a racial basis from anything like German citizenship. 
he wanted to expel them from Germany. Now he prepared for his most daring move, which was the cancellation of the non-militarized status of the Western Rhineland. That was a strategic change of great importance. Well after the Versailles Treaty, a democratic and pro-Western government of Germany agreed with the Western powers, first of all with France, that there would be no German military installations on the west bank of the Rhine across the French frontier. The French had added, or, th or thought they had added, to their security by building the so-called Maginot Line, an array of impressive fortresses containing heavy artillery along their frontier with Germany. On March 6, 1936, Hitler decreed and ordered the remilitarization of the Western Rhineland. Thereby, he instantly abolished that most important element for the security of France and Belgium in the event of a war with Germany. This was his biggest gamble up to that point, and he succeeded. The reactions of the French government, the one most directly affected, were feeble. They depended on the British, and the British chose not to do anything. I shall have to return to Britain in the 30s, but before that we must realize that the tendency to come to terms with Hitler's Germany now began to influence entire governments and peoples throughout Europe, indeed throughout the world. What Hitler and the Third Reich represented seemed to be something like the wave of the future, the Olympics staged in Berlin in 1936 were a shining example of it. But all of this went beyond semblances, images, reputations. Mussolini decided to join Hitler. Hence, the so-called Rome-Berlin axis was born. In Mussolini's case, this was more than a, a politic or politic or strategic politic or strategic calculation. He was convinced that the bourgeois democracies, the remnant powers of Western Europe, including even Britain, were at or at least close to the end of their tether.